I'm going to stick mine up there. So. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Abel is stepping in today um, as a great favor to you and to the Oli Foundation. Um, for Dr. McCollum, who wasn't well enough to come and visit today and give his presentation, he's going to give a wonderful talk on gastroparesis treatment options. And um, I imagine, Tom, that you'd be willing to take <clears throat> excuse me, um, questions on other motility issues um, as they arise since you've got expertise in in addition to gastroparesis, and we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. He did this talk for us as a webinar about two weeks ago, and there was about 25 minutes um, worth of time to ask questions, and I'm not doing my usual introduction, so we should have even more time. So um, I'm going to let Tom take over now. So here you go, Dr. Abel, you're on. Okay, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. I, I actually had a cold myself earlier this week, so hopefully I'll uh, keep going, but I've got some water here. If I if I need to. Uh, let me uh, make sure I can advance this. Hold on a second here. Here we go. Uh, some disclosures. Uh, uh, my primary funding is uh, NIH related. Uh, I also uh, have some as an investigator for some uh, pharmaceuticals uh, related to motility and uh, editors, editor of three different areas, a reviewer for up to date and have some intellectual property. And I'll discuss some off-label drugs and devices. In fact, as they say, almost, almost everything we do is off-label, unfortunately. So today I want to talk first about an introduction and some personal statements, then the current status of patients with gastroparesis and the gastroparesis-like disorders, emphasizing the important role, I think, of federal involvement in the NIH, FDA, and Medicare. Uh, before talking about treatment, I want to talk about pathophysiology of gastroparesis syndromes, which is a little bit different terminology than others may use, and then talk a little bit about uh, teams, related care teams, including support groups, which of course uh, you're all well aware of the value of, and then some concluding, concluding comments. So and there'll be plenty of time to talk. Uh, so from a personal perspective, I'm 69. I'm a physician that work on GM motility and other areas. I've been doing this for 50 years since I was in college, actually, in Connecticut, not too far from where you are. I used to take a Metro North train up to New Haven from Grand Central. Uh, and uh, the perspective over 50 years, I think, has changed from things being kind of bad, good, mixed now in the future. And, and I actually got interested because of uh, my uh, my own uh, observations of migraine-related nausea, vomiting, and friends and family members. And I was assured at, at Yale University in 1968 that these were all psychosomatic. Uh, and so I went on a quest to see how could this be possible. Well, of course, as you'll find out, they're not psychosomatic. They're organic disorders. But uh, despite all that, this presentation is just my own opinions. It's not the University of Louisville, which I work. It's not the NIH. It's not any support group. It's just my my view. So symptoms of gastroparesis, uh, the main symptoms and common symptoms are really three things, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. And patients have one or more of these in the vast majority of patients. But they have other symptoms too, bloating, distension, loss of appetite, or, or anorexia and may have many other symptoms. For example, they may have lower symptoms, constipation, diarrhea, fecal incontinence. Many have urinary symptoms, urinary hesitancy or urinary frequency. Some have interstitial cystitis, which is an inflammatory disease. Uh, and then uh, other patients have autonomic symptoms, such as dizziness and cold intolerance, heat intolerance. Many patients, about half those we see with severe disorders, have migraine headaches. Uh, and many have muscle pains, often diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Many have autoimmune diseases. Some have overly flexible joints. And some patients have cyclic symptom patterns. I'm not talking about cyclic vomiting, which is a specific disorder, but they just have cycles. They do well for a few days, and they don't, and they don't do well for a few days. Many have family history of symptoms, and others may have seizures or other neurologic disorders. So there's a variety of symptoms with gastroparesis, which raises the question, what are all these symptoms from? Uh, many symptoms uh, I've just described have been seen with acute illness. I, I, just, I just got over a cold, and my, 
my uh, one of my family members had the flu, and so with viral infections, you can get a lot of these symptoms. But with gastroparesis, you may have recurrent or chronic symptoms. And unfortunately, most providers, including myself, never learned about this in medical school, either in school, training, or practice. And thus, they may devalue, not value these symptoms, or value the illnesses and thus the patients, and sometimes not the doctors. So uh, I'm going to start out with what may seem a little abrupt, but I think that uh, it's really what the patients have taught me over the last 50 years is that uh, what I call the M's or Mrs. Uh, miserable, misunderstood, misdiagnosed, mismanaged, mistreated, uh, which is really, uh, in, uh, really uh, 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 more of a reflection of those of us as physicians and our failings. But hopefully these days are, are largely past us. What I've learned, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I've learned about the history of gastroparesis treatments, which weren't very effective in the past. Secondly, particularly in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Cutts, my, my colleague, psychologist, and I really had nearly 100 focus groups, uh, in which we've looked at over the last 25 years. But uh, we had 100 of those in the 90s alone. Third, uh, I, I've been impressed how little we, we know about gastroparesis, and fourth, how much patients are trying to tell us if we'll just listen. And last uh, is how much suffering, which is now called the disease burden, exists. But that is the history of much in medicine. This is a slide from uh, some of the work that Dr. Cutts and I published uh, looking at uh, the SF36. And if you're not familiar with the SF36, it's one of the standard generic quality of life, health-related quality of life measures. It was actually based on two weeks in Dayton, Ohio in 1974. Uh, looking at the population, and then by the RAND Corporation and others uh, came up with these various things. And so you can look at physical function, pain, social function, general health. And here's a, a large sample of people with uh, gastroparesis. Uh, and uh, we were looking at uh, how well this related to other measures we look at, for example, the Medicare criteria for severity of illness, intensity of service, and organ systems involves. And as you can see, uh, there are a lot of problems with physical functioning, a lot of body pain, a lot of general health issues, a lot of social functioning, a little less with uh, some of the other symptoms. And uh, it's interesting that those body pain, social function, mental function correlate strongly. General health didn't correlate significantly. So people are, are, are sick. Uh, uh, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to back up here a second if I can figure out how to, how to back up here quickly. Um, I'm, I'm a little challenged here, but let me, let me back up. Uh, go for data from our focus groups again. The team approach is crucial for helping patients. Uh, I think that's one thing that became uh, clear early on, that the autonomic nervous system is part of the illness and may not just be the GI tract that's involved. Thirdly, that the providers often underestimate the effect of the illness on quality of life. Uh, next is the increased levels of anxiety and depression and some are likely due to the trauma of the illness, not, not the cause of the illness. People will say, well, gee, this patient sure seemed anxious to me. That, thus, that might be the cause. And, uh, but it's not necessarily the cause. I think it's probably a result of the illness. And so, therefore, well-intentioned providers often make things worse, trying to make things better. So federal involvement with gastroparesis, I think, is quite important. Uh, the National Institute of Health Gastroparesis Research Consortium was set up in response to patient needs. Patients contacting the congressmen and the senators and NIH saying, we need help. And literally, this was started in, in the patient's kitchen. Uh, and the GPCRC site, if you haven't looked at it, I think it's worth looking at. It's in its 11th year, uh, and it has a site for patients. Um, there are, uh, it's gpcrc.us. So the, the, the consortium has uh, worked on many things and much effort, particularly with publications. Also, the FDA has been very helpful in defining what should be measured and reported in trials, which I realize is misspelled here, trials for gastroparesis. That's my error. Medicare has not covered some home therapies. Uh, and as the Ole Foundation is quite aware, some of this has been corrected by recent congressional action, but not everything. So it's still hard to get some things covered, particularly by Medicare at home. Uh, what the GPCRC has done, and this is my observation, but 
It's defined the disease burden, it's made descriptions, it's made better diagnosis, it's detailed illness, and talked about distinctive pathophysiology. It's also, I think, helped uh, stem interest in the FDA and uh, supported their proposals on Medicare coverage that have, some of which have been enacted, but of course not, not enough. So I'd like to talk about, uh, oops, if I can back up a second, see if I can figure out how to do that. Um, I knew I was challenged when I, let me, let me go here once again. Yes. Um, yes, here we go. Thank you. Hopefully I, uh, my new computer, my new Dell computer is a little more sensitive than my fingers. So from the GPCRC, uh, uh, we looked at people without delay in gastric emptying, with delay in gastric emptying. Uh, and uh, we found that people uh, what we call gastroparesis like syndrome are identical in every way except for emptying. I mean, in every way, age, sex, diagnosis, years ill. So patients with gastric emptying uh, studies may not be the best way to differentiate patients. And as I'll show you in a minute, uh, um, uh, uh, there's probably there's probably a reason for that, but some ancillary work is now looking at that quite a bit. So recent full thickness biopsies, which we do frequently when we do a J tube or we do a, a gastric stimulator, uh, have enabled the uh, gastroparesis consortium to set up a core lab and look at this. And we look at things like the interstitial cells of Cajal, uh, which are decreased in all patients with symptoms of gastroparesis. But as you'll see. As those numbers get lower, gastric emptying has become delayed, and I'll show you on this next, I hope, next slide. Uh, this on the, the, the up, upright axis here, the y-axis, is the circular muscle, inner muscle. This is number of uh, interstitial cells of Gahal per hyperbaric field, and this was named after Ramon E. Gahal, who uh, described these uh, around 100 years ago, re received the Nobel Prize in 1908 for his work. And he figured all this out by light microscopy, which is really amazing. We now have uh, special stains for this. But on the right there are the, uh, uh, on the, uh, and I don't, I don't have a uh, uh, stylus here, but uh, the, the control patients, and usually there's about five or six per high powered field. Uh, if you have gastroparesis, you have a two or three and you have delayed emptying. But if you have unexplained nausea vomiting, you see you have decreased number of Cajal cells, but you haven't gotten enough delay or enough to decrease to be delayed. So what a lot of patients are seeing in their emptying study is non-delayed, and the patients say, well, you know, you can't really be sick because uh, you don't have gastroparesis, you're not delayed. But to me, that's a little bit like saying, uh, let's say you're a patient with uh, heart disease and you have angina because you're not getting enough blood flow, and people could say to you, well, come back and see me when you have your heart attack, then, you know, then I know you're really sick and I'll take care of you. Of course, that would be crazy. No one would treat patients that way but they have been treated that way sometimes with nausea and vomiting. So I think, and this is my opinion, this is really a spectrum, that there's decrease in interstitial cells of Cajal for a number of reasons that aren't fully understood, and then they finally get low enough and you become delayed and emptying. So what does this mean? In my, in my own and others' views, gastroparesis and gastroparesis-like syndrome can be viewed as part of a spectrum but many others would not agree with us, particularly outside of the U.S. Many people in Europe would not agree with this at all. So there's no general agreement or consensus. And what is widely circulated in some new work, and in my opinions from this new work, are largely my opinions. So the Diabetes Applications Consortium, also NIH uh, funded and related to the uh, Clinical Research Consortium, uh, funded us a couple of years ago to look at a group of diabetic and non-diabetic patients. It's a small group, and we looked at five things. We looked at uh, inflammation by whatever method, systemic inflammation. We looked at the autonomic nervous system, and we found that people were inflamed and had abnormal autonomic nervous system measures. We then, from the same group, looked at their internal nervous system by full thickness biopsies as well as other biopsies, and they were abnormal. We looked at electrophysiology, which is what I've worked on for decades confirmed that, that, that people have abnormal electrical activity, just like with the heart, you do with the stomach. But we also found hormonal abnormalities. Even if you're not diabetic, many patients with gastroparesis have abnormal uh, metabolic and appetite hormones. 
So my own conclusion, it's just my view, is that gastroparesis can be looked at as a systemic disease with variable presentations of symptoms. Uh, and our work on this is actually on, uh, if you want to look at it, it's on the uh, clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, so it's, it's not published, but, the, uh, but the, all, all the uh, investigations there. We also looked in this, in this cheap study for the, uh, uh, the diabetes consortium, we looked at the mechanisms of therapy for gastric stem, stimulation, GES, which I'm very interested in, and showed several possible mechanisms of action that related to the pathophysiology. But I won't emphasize this. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about therapies. And I will use the title COPS. I realized when I reviewed this this morning, I should have said COPES. Maybe it would have been better. C for chronic disease, O for options, P for particulars, and searches. I could have said electronic searches. Uh, so let me go through uh, COPS or COPES with you. So chronic illness, the, what I call the Cs, uh, starts with home care and primary care. And I'm a former primary care doc myself supported myself doing primary care hospitalist in the ER during the, uh, the, the number of years that I was a research fellow. Then there's internet care, which uh, these days I think almost anybody goes to next. Acute care, chronic care, hospital care. Everybody experiences all these, but they need to be integrated. So I think working as a team with ongoing communication is essential. It's gotten a little easier with uh, texting and pagers, but it's amazing to me as a primary care doctor how many people are seen and taken care of by others and we never, we never find out. And unfortunately, the, the promise of electronic medical records is, is, remains undelivered. So the options for therapy, I'm going to spend more time on that because that's the title of this talk. I call them the Ds, diet and drugs, nutritional support, uh, diet, nutritional support, drugs, devices, disruption, divert, I'll talk about that, and detoxify, I'll discuss separately, but why are there not, why are there not more treatments? Uh, and I think that there's a lot of reasons. I think one is there's still the belief, and I, it's, uh, I'm a very religious person, but beliefs are about religion. Data, science should be about data. There's the belief that GP is not a real disease, and there's a belief that GP is not a biologic problem. Both of those are wrong, in my opinion, but many people still have those beliefs. There's a lack of understanding of mechanisms, as I talked about the GPCRC, and many others are starting to understand that. There's limited resources for new drugs, so that's changing, and then there's a narrow view about range of therapeutic options. I think all of these contribute to the lack of good treatment options for gastroparesis. So diet, nutritional support. The traditional approach is to advise frequent small meals of limited digestibility. The problem is this only works with certain patients. And also the majority of patients, and no one, you won't be shocked by this, but I think we were in the consortium, that most people with gastroparesis are never seen by a nutritionist, even in referral centers. It's a, it's, it's, it, there are a lot of reasons for that. Part of it's we don't work with our nutrition colleagues enough. A lot of it's reimbursement. People don't get paid. Part of it's we don't think of it. We think we know what we want to do, but it's, it's, it's a real problem that those of you at the Oli Foundation would understand. Um, the, a little bit more on nutritional support, which won't be news to you, that enteral nutrition is best, but not everybody can do this. Not everybody can eat by mouth. Small bowel feedings are an option, and we usually try nasal germ tubes, then a permanent tube. But limited expertise of problems with tubes, as you're aware. Not everybody can have successful small bowel feedings. They either don't have enough small bowel or it doesn't work. And uh, well, my own pitch, which is that most people that get tubes have never had a small bowel full thickness biopsy. To me, that's a little like treating cancer and never having a tissue diagnosis. If you don't know what's there, if you don't know what the nerve and muscle abnormality is, it's really going to be hard to treat it appropriately. So even more on nutrition support, TPN is the only option for many patients, and the full discussion is beyond today's talk. But of course, it's wonderful, but not easy. It's not, not inexpensive, and it's not risk-free. And unfortunately, expertise in TPN varies widely. Uh, there's many excellent TPN pharmacies and support groups like OLE really are just crucial for people on TPN. Uh, drugs can be discussed by class, the antimetic group, prokinetics, and others. Many are available worldwide, but not all those are in the U.S., some are investigational. And there is fortunately renewed interest by pharmaceutical companies in drugs for gastroparesis. The antimetic drugs, which I've listed here, chemical and then generic names like promethazine and phenergan, and pro 
chlorpyrazine and chlorcomposine are helpful. Unfortunately, you may be aware there's been a nationwide shortage of Finnegan that's ongoing for months and months. So a lot of our patients at home can't get uh, Finnegan. Uh, Benadryl can be useful. Uh, Sofran and the other uh, ondansetron-like drugs can be helpful. Trans uh, scopolamine can be helpful and Marinol can be helpful. So they're all useful drugs. Uh, prokinetic drugs, we have only one approved, which is really unfortunate because it has a number of safety issues, both short and long term. So it's recommended for maximum usually about six to eight weeks. And it can be a, a lot of help to people, but it has a number of limitations. Other prokinetic drugs include a prepotent, which could be a symptomatic drug or a MEND, which we've shown the consortium can be helpful, but it's very expensive. And uh, despite having documented efficacy, erythromycin can be helpful, but may not work long term, and some people can't tolerate it. Now the drugs are not studied, or they're not studied symptomatically. Uh, more on drugs would be investigational drugs not approved in the U.S., like domperidone. It's safer than menoclopramide, but complex to obtain, and other investigational drugs are in clinical trials, all under FDA guidance, and we're very interested in the FDA, as always, is trying to respond to patients and patient groups for new ways to get drugs uh, more, more quickly. So even more on drugs. Uh, most of these are oral drugs. Most are small tablets, fortunately, but some suppositories and liquids. Some can be given IV, but IV therapies, again, is beyond the scope of the talk today. The real risk with IV therapies, including IV access issues, blood clots, bleeding, infections. There's some coverage issues by the insurers, and you need a dedicated team to administer. In our office, for example, we have a nurse that really that's all, it's a she, that's all she does is IV therapy for our patients. Uh, 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 drugs for pain and gastroparesis is a very complex issue. It's difficult for most patients and most providers, unfortunately beyond the scope of this presentation. But one approach, which is what we do, is we try to get every patient with gastroparesis with pain to see a pain specialist with the idea that pain should be able to be treated, even though we realize that doesn't often happen in practice. Devices for gastroparesis are of limited availability. There's only one approved device. There's many regulatory insurance and other issues. I'm not going to talk about that today, even though uh, although we're happy to answer questions. Uh, that's primarily what I've worked on for the last 25 years. It was approved. The first one was 25 years ago, 1992, and approved in 2000. And it was re recommended for compassionate use by the ACG guidelines in 2013. It can be very helpful but beyond the discussion today. Now, diverting and disrupting, what do I mean by that? I mean the fact that the stomach has an inlet, an upper and lower parts, and an outlet, and there's increased, increased interest in the pyloric outlet dysfunction. Uh, that's clearly an issue for many patients, particularly with those with delayed emptying, and there are many new approaches, including not only the traditional one of pyloroplasty, uh, but the uh, endoscopic approaches, and none of which have been conclusively shown to always help but I try to discuss them with patients and say, you know, we can try to do something since you're delayed about your pylorus. Uh, this is something that the GPS CRC is actively looking at as well as many others. And detoxify, what do I mean about that? Is that many, what I mean is many patients have systemic issues, generalized symptoms and disordered physiology, but some have neuromuscular issues as measured by blood and or tissue. Well, largely this we think is inflammation and some therapies like uh, IVIG, IV immunoglobulin, which is an off-label use for IVIG, can be quite helpful. There have been two uh, published peer-reviewed studies and many case reports and, and others in the works. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I would at least let people know about that. So the particulars, oops, I dropped up. I lost again here, so let me, let me see if I can back up. Um, all right, particulars. The P's, patients and protectors, which by that I mean their family, the providers, the partnerships, the pharmacies, professional companies, and I should really mention insurance companies working together, really a true team with any chronic illness. Uh, I spend, uh, I used to joke that I occasionally see patients I'm mostly on the phone with, with insurers, which I am, but I'm also insure with, with other, all these P's, and it's, it's just, it's so crucial. I don't think with this audience at the Oak Foundation, I have to talk about how important this is, but without it, we just can't deliver good care. I'm currently in a transplant uh, center 
or uh, and uh, I'm a former transplant doc, pancreas kidney doc for 12 years, and uh, it's it's that's what it's all about is chronic illness is getting a team. So uh, searches or could could have been copes for electronic searches, but what I see is the future of searches, and I don't mean internet searches. I mean what I call first pre-search, which is talking about the issues like today, particularly talking with uh, with patients, which I think is frankly the most important thing. And then I call research, uh, which is formal work like the GPCRC and others, and pro-search, which is the education of providers, because I knew nothing about this, and I was well educated in primary care. I was educated in both internal medicine and family medicine. I knew nothing about this. I call future, future search. How do we get to the future? I think work groups are crucial. I think knowing the federal resources, the NIH, FDA, and Medicare is is the crucial because really it all boils down to education and funding, and uh, and and working together. So in summary, most things in medicine are opinions, not facts. And thus, I've given you my opinions over 50 years. As I see it, I saw it sort of very bad that became better. Or Good, maybe I said good, maybe better than kind of mixed. We have it now, which I think is better. Uh, and the future, uh, I hope, will be better yet. I tried to focus on therapies, but I tried to do this by going in the background why I think things are the way they are right now and what the emerging under, uh, understandings of pathophysiology are. But especially teams and supports in the context of the illness we call gastroparesis, which, when severe, is GI tract failure. Uh, you know, a number of our patients end up getting uh, not only TPN, but some get small bowel transplants. Uh, when you have severe gastroparesis, you have GI tract failure. So my concluding comments, five of them, my bottom lines. Number one, GP has been misunderstood, which is not unusual in the history of medicine. Secondly, many illnesses may take decades or longer to be understood. Uh, secondly, now accepted as a legitimate illness, so still not everybody agrees, particularly not outside the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., the NIH and the FDA are engaged in working on this problem, and Medicare can be lobbied. I mean, particularly patients, and they don't always listen to me. But patients are, are voters. But number four, much has been learned over the last decade about gastroparesis and gut failure, but much more needs to be done. And again, the partnerships of patients, protectors, and providers may need to be the key to making this happen, with a lot of exclamation points. So web access is very important. I mentioned the GPC or site. Support groups like OLE, GPAC, AGMD, uh, IFMG, a whole, whole bunch of others. Uh, most of you probably know them better than I do. Uh, I will try to answer any and all questions I can today, and, and any others you could send to Rosalind. Her email is right here, and you probably have it in your uh, meetings from the material. So we will try, if we can't answer them today, we'll try to answer them in a timely manner. So let me let me stop there, uh, uh, and uh, hope hope that's been helpful for you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Abel. I'm going to open it up to questions then from the audience. Sound good to you? Great. Okay. Great. Does anybody have a question? Sure. Here we go, Olivia. If you speak into the mic, he'll be able to hear you. Okay. Um, if I understood correctly, you had mentioned something about the hunger hormones not necessarily being affected. Um, does this m mean that like binging and purging type behavior could occur because of gastroparesis? Great, great question. Actually, I probably misspoke, but what we were looking at, we were looking at ghrelin and leptin, and then we were looking at insulin, glucagon, and amylon, ghrelin and leptin having to do with appetite, uh, and, uh, and insulin and, the, uh, and glucagon uh, Related to blood sugars and amylins, co secreted with insulin. So we were just looking at those, thinking, well, they might be abnormal in the diabetics, but we didn't think they'd be abnormal in the non diabetics, but they were abnormal in both. Uh, and uh, we also looked in this uh, thing that will eventually be on clinical trials. We looked at a lot of the patients' overlap symptoms, reflux, uh, fibromyalgia, and found lots of correlations. Uh, uh, I don't know uh, that I. Uh, I don't know the role that plays in binging and purging, but I can tell you that I spent two years of my life at the Mayo Clinic as a research fellow on an NIH-funded project looking at uh, classic anorexia nervosa, and that was published uh, 30 years ago in gastroenterology. And uh, we knew then that there were a lot of abnormalities related to 
uh, with the quote, class and eating disorders, which were, I learned on day one, were never psychiatric disorders. Interestingly, when you refed those people who were starved, a lot of the abnormalities were still there. So there's something more with quote eating disorders than just than just the eating disorder. There's something abnormal, and, I, and it may actually be a central nervous system disorder. But uh, uh, so uh, I, I personally think this is an area that has not been looked at well. And we, we in the consortium, for example, have stored blood on people. We're hoping to go back and look at now with these hormonal analyses, look back in large samples of patients and try to see what's there. Uh, and if we're able to do that, it will take us some, quite some time. But we, we hope we can, can get some answers to your excellent questions, which I, which I don't have today. Hello, um, my daughter is nine and she has been on Raglan for seven years, twice a day. Um, I was wondering if the domiperidone is as effective in children um, and is it even possible for children to take it or is it for adults only? Well, uh, it's, good. it's a good question. Uh, I don't, I'm not that familiar with the rules on the IND in the U.S., but uh, it's certainly, uh, the, one can look at the literature, it's been used in kids. Uh, I, I, I'm also trained in peds as well as adults, so I call them kids, but uh, it's also been used in younger patients as well as older. And uh, uh, just in general, for, for the drug, the safety profile is better with don't period on. There's, there's, there's no question that's because it's not primarily a central, it's more peripheral dopamine antagonist. So uh, Actually, my wife was a child psychiatrist, and I wrote a letter to the editor about this a number of years ago. So it's on it's on Medline, with our own views about this, uh, being concerned about uh, uh, trying to get people on domperidone rather than Reglan if possible. So uh, I can't comment obviously on your daughter because uh, I don't know her, and I, whatever state she lives in, I'm probably not licensed to practice. But but in general, uh, uh, it's something that I think uh, it could be looked at. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you for your talk today. I have a question about um, when you're talking about gastroparesis and sometimes paired with pseudo obstruction of the intestinal tract, what you see the role of perhaps the nervous system might be in that and paired with that, um, have you heard any conversations about gamma core, which is a new product that's going to stimulate the vagus nerve being used off-label for treatments of gastroparesis? Okay, now gamma core, I'm not sure what that is. So I don't, I don't, know, I don't know the trade name. Can you fill me in on what this is a drug? It's, or a, it's an external device. So it's a physical device that you actually put um, near your jugular on your neck. Mm -hmm. And the concept is that it stimulates the vagus nerve right there where it comes close to the top of the surface. Um, it's being marketed for cluster headaches, but being used off-label in the fall, I believe, will be the first trial for um, I some can, GI disorders. Sure, I can comment because I'm the, I'm the I just didn't know the training. I'm the I'm the GI stimulation editor for neuromodulation for that journal, so I'm I'm pretty familiar with uh, a lot of the things that have been developed in Europe with the concept of non-invasive vagal stimulation. There's a couple of uh, uh, products that I or I guess that uh, that are coming out. One is uh, using auricular stimulation in the left vagus in the, the left ear only is where the branch of the vagus nerve comes. And, and, and uh, I actually wrote an article about that a couple of years ago. But, uh, uh, and then the, uh, the, the, the next stimulation, uh, there have been uh, at the International Neurostimulation Meeting, and there, there, was a, there was some data presented in Edinburgh a couple of months ago, uh, or about a month ago, uh, on using that in people with GI uh, motor disorders. And it looked, from reading the abstract anyway, it looked like it was helpful. I think, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, the concept of vagal stimulation is, is, uh, is, is a very good one. It's also been looked at now for Crohn's disease, and we had a, a talk on that at the INS meeting from France on Crohn's. Uh, so, I, so I think, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's promising for any motor disorder. Uh, and uh, there are a number of other uh, stimulation therapies that probably work in part by vagal mechanisms. Um, so I, we'll have to see it. It's going to be an exciting time. 
Okay, thank you. Sure. Hello. Um, I just wondered, when you're looking at a patient and wanted to do a workup, what are some of the blood work and um, I, you did mention the biopsy, the full thickness biopsy, um, but what tests help you to make the diagnosis of gastroparesis? Well, clearly, uh, good question. You know, there's no, there's no single blood test. Uh, we, we look, routinely we measure inflammatory markers, uh, SED rate and CRP. And I also measure fibrinogen factor eight, but uh, those are also blood clotting disorder uh, uh, measures that can be elevated. Uh, we, of course, look at routine laboratory. Uh, if there's nutritional compromise, we, we and others have a, a nutritional panel to look at micronutrient as well as nutrient measures. Uh, so those are, those are kind of our standard. Uh, but for some other patients, uh, we also do a neuromuscular abnormality uh, uh, panel. I think Mayo Clinic has one that you can order commercially, but we have one that, that we send out around the country to various labs. Uh, uh, most of the ones I mentioned in that uh, NIH study, most of those were our investigational uh, tests that we did. We were looking at uh, cytokine levels and neurohormone levels. And, uh, but we don't do those routinely right now, but perhaps in the future they will be. Uh, but, but most of it right now is still history and physical and some sort of focused lab but I, I am particularly interested in looking for people that have systemic inflammation from, uh, because uh, I think they're at risk for, uh, many of those people end up getting IV accesses and I think they're at risk for blood clots and infections. So I, I hope, I don't know how good an answer that was, but I hope it was helpful. Very helpful, thank you. Hello, Dr. Abel, this is Mary Smithers here. Oh, hey. Hi. <laughs> Have um, you seen any connection between Lyme disease and gastroparesis? Well, uh, you know, I've I've seen a number of patients that have contributed to that. Uh, uh, Lyme disease is a you know is a fascinating disease, and of course, you're not far where it was originally described in New, up in New Haven. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the difficulty has been, it's been the way that it's diagnosed because it's confirming the diagnosis. Um, and as I understand it, I, I'm, I'm no expert in it, but I know the Centers for Disease Control is looking at for some new ways uh, 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 biochemically to try to make further diagnosis. So I, I, I think there are probably some people where there's a strong connection. I just don't know who those are currently right now. Uh, it would it would certainly make sense, uh, but uh, I, I've only seen a few couple people that I thought maybe it was connected. But we're just uh, it's one of those things we're just very ignorant about it. Uh, I hope I hope it's of some help. I'll send you my records. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm happy to look at them. Dr. Abel, is there a gastroparesis pseudo-obstruction diet? Great question. I mean, there, there are. I don't know if there's one that's been, um, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of them out there, and most of them emphasize things that are basically easy to digest. Um, the problem is when I talk to patients, uh, it, it varies so widely what they can tolerate. Uh, so I don't think that we do a very good job with that. Um, but uh, I, I'm also not I'm not a nutritionist, and and uh, that's not my primary field. But uh, uh, I I I don't know. If there's any one diet that I think works universally. Does anyone else have a question here? Oh, got another one up front. I'm just curious if you know anything about the population of ALS patients, and I am involved with them, and I suspect that late stage, that there's some degree of dysautonomia in many of them, 
and this is all just sort of coming together and I'm thinking I bet they have some gastroparesis what do you know of that or think you know I don't I don't know I don't know much about ALS because and, and I know that the understanding particularly genetically and micro and, and uh, genomically has changed so much uh, which hopefully will lead to better treatments I, I, I can tell you that I know a fair amount about Parkinson's uh, and I know uh, quite a bit about spinal cord injury because I'm literally sitting in a building that's spinal cord center right now uh, and they they both get gastroparesis both spinal cord injury so uh, and 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 the guest and Parkinson's not in every case but in many cases so it would not surprise me that that's probably part of the problem um, but uh, that's that's the limit of my knowledge unfortunately Dr. Abel, I'm Carol Arrington Jones. I'm a registered dietitian. I work with a lot of gastroparesis patients, and boy, it it is a variable food tolerance, but also time of the day seems to be somewhat related to foods tolerated. Is there? We seem to see that. Is there something to that? Like some people are great in the morning, and as time goes on, they're not as well, and then I. Tell someone that Eric, they say, "Oh no, I'm, I'm better at night." Go ahead. I'm, I'm glad, glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you're there because because we need we need your expertise. Uh, but uh, yes, we, it's very common to see a, a, what I call a circadian, and I and I, I don't think anybody's understood that. I've I've thought that, that might be central because I back when I was doing my first residency, uh, I worked used to work in a sleep lab back in the 70s. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so many of those things are, are have a central origin to them uh, that that it would make it would make sense to me. But there definitely seems to be circadian. Some people say, you know, I I vomit every morning, but I can eat at night. Or others say, I can eat every morning, but I vomit every night. Just like you said, it's I mean, from a pathophysiology point of view, it's fascinating. From a patient point of view, of course, it's miserable. Uh, and uh, from a clinical point of view, the question is, could we somehow leverage that other than saying, you know, eat when you can eat? Uh, but that's really hard for, particularly for people with diabetes where, where they've got to be able to regulate the amount of, uh, of, uh, of intake to be able to ma manage their diabetes, for example. But yeah, I, th I, I see that all the time. Does anyone else have a question in the room? And since I've got the great Dr. Abel here, I'm so excited. So uh, my question is, I, I am, in, when I talk to people, I often say, now watch out for fibrous foods and certain foods because we don't want you to get a bezoar. I mean, how often do you see bezoars with gastroparesis? I do love saying bezoar, but um, how? Oh, well, I'm going to let him take what it, someone here asked. What is a bezoar? So, if I'll let you take that as our expert, and then tell us how often you see that, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, they're they're collections of basically non-digestible material. It can be a number of specific types of bezoars, the things that don't get digested and don't get out of the stomach, uh, and 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 whatever is ingested. Uh, and actually, we don't see it that often, uh, but it's a fascinating disorder when we do see it. Uh, and actually, I reviewed for uh, up to date. Up to date has a nice. Uh, for those of you that are look look into up to date, I'm a reviewer for them. But they they have a nice one on Bezoar that I actually reviewed a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, they were speculating about why 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 you don't always see it. I mean, you see some people that don't really quote have gastroparesis, but they get Bezoars anyway. Uh, so. Uh, uh, to go back to the original part of your question, you know, people are advised not to have fiber, and yet some people can tolerate fiber. I, I think as we understand more about gastric physiology, which we still understand very little about, and the interplay between proximal and distal stomach and pylorus, we'll probably understand more about bezoar formation. Uh, there, the one exception would be there are some people, uh, classically developmentally disabled people, that uh, will swallow hair and other things. That become even harder to digest, but for most people, it's not a, it's not a, a thing of swallowing what they shouldn't. It's just a question of trying to eat and not being able to get it out of the stomach. 
Okay. So last chance for questions, guys. Okay, then I'm going to just say thank you, Dr. Abel, very much for speaking to us today, for joining us on a number of different levels, one with your expertise and your wonderful approach with patients, but also <clears throat> for stepping in last minute and being such a champ about it. Well, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm, sir, I'm impressed that everybody came at this hour of the day. So. Yeah. <laughs> Say yeah, you've got to, 22 people in the room here. <laughs> I had a Connecticut for me. I'm sure I couldn't be there. Okay, so we'll sign out now. Okay. Thank you very much. So if anybody wanted to talk more about the diet issue, we do have a dietitian in the room who has some suggestions for people with motility disorders. But if you don't, you're more than welcome to, to exit. <clears throat> That's okay, right? Sure. In case you're not familiar, this is Carol Ireton Jones. Yeah. Dr. Carol Ireton Jones. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. Any anything that I can answer? I know I have Kathy. I have something for you. I'm going to give you my gastroparesis diet. <laughs> so it, it, the only thing I, I think that I have found is I think if you have gastroparesis, you're darn sure. I, I mean, it's it's not like the stomach is the only thing. It just always seems to be. Um, you know, there's some small intestine involved, even though I get all the consults from the doctors that say this person has gastroparesis. It's, it's so, it seems like it's so much more involved in that. And um, I actually went to a lecture by Dr. McCallum who um, didn't get to come and I, and I actually, uh, I changed up my diet plan based on what he said and I think that one of the things that Dr. Abel probably didn't have the time to do and what do I do with that? Well I may have to borrow yours back for a minute Kathy. Oh wait there there it is there it is. Kathy just knows me that's how come she got she got this. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Um, McCallum had said was he kind of he actually graded gastroparesis to mild, moderate, and severe, and I think that it, it was a kind of a good thing because he said mild in, when it's mild nutrition is your big thing, um, making sure you get in adequate nutrition, and then um, glucose control if there is a problem, and then antihematic therapy. So if you're vomiting, you know you're losing nutrients. So he said that was probably the first.